if we manage to figure out how to drive uh, life's evolution, um, in in it can if it can evolve uh, a, a sophisticated sort of informatic um, processing system like this, you may ask yourself what might um, chemical systems be capable of independently doing under different circumstances. Yeah, so like locally, they're intelligent locally. They don't need the rest of the shebang. Like they don't need the big they picture. They need so that that's that's a great segue into what makes this biological, right? The the heart of the cellular acti activities are translation. You kill translation, you kill the cell. Yes. You not only the translation itself, you kill a, a, the component that initiates it. You kill the cell. You kill. You remove the component that elongates it. You kill the cell. So there are many different ways to disrupt this machinery. They all the part all the parts are important. Now it it can vary across different organisms. We see variation between bacteria versus eukaryotes versus archaea, right? So it is not the same ex it, same exact steps, but it can get more crowded as we get closer to eukaryotes, for instance. But you are still computing about um, twenty amino acids per second, right? This is this is what you're generating every second. That single machinery is doing 20 a second? 20 a, 21 for bacteria, I believe 8 for eukaryotes or 9. 21 a second. I mean, that's super inefficient or super efficient, depending on how you think about it. I think it's great. I mean, I can Yeah, but it's way slower than a computer could generate if there's simulation. I, I think if you can show me a computer that does this, we are done here. Well, this is the big, this includes the five things, <laughs> not just, but I could show you a computer that's doing the informatic, right? I, like, yes, you can show me that, but you right. cannot show me the one that has all. For but, now. For now. I will ask you about probably what uh, AlphaFold, right? Uh, the, I think the more we learn about, and th this is why early life and origin is also very fascinating and applicable to many different disciplines. Uh, there is no way you see this the way we just described it unless you think about early life and early geochemistry and uh, earliest emergent systems. But going going back to the biological component, um, all of these attributes that we think about life or that we associate with biology stems from translation and as well as metabolism. But I see metabolism as a way to keep translation going, and translation keeps metabolism going. But translation is arguably a bit more sophisticated process for the reasons that um, I just described. So metabolism is a source of energy for this translation process. It's a it's a it's a way to process materials, uh, and it is inherently dynamic, and it is um, flexible. But it is not focused on rep repetition as translation does. So that's the main difference. Translation is the kind of, in a way, just it repeats, right? So you have the metabolism that can synthesize materials, it creates or benefits from available energy. And again, it's a dynamic system. Um, and then you have computation that it that is inherently uh, repetitive, right? It needs to carry out repetitive processes. Uh, it, and it does the tasks and it, it implements an algorithm, but it is not dynamic. So you see both of those attributes in translation combined. It is repetitive and it is dynamic uh, and it also processes this information. So they are fundamentally different. I don't know if you can get um, life if you don't find a way to process the information around you. In a repetitive, dynamic way. Yeah, and somehow that that's what uh, got um, selected, maybe not selected, I don't know if it was um, accidental, but that that's what it seems to be conserved for four billion years, that that's what life established. Upon. What, what's the connection between translation and the self-replication, which seems to be a, a another weird thing that life just started doing, wanting to just replicate itself? I think when we truly understand the answer to that question, we may have just made ourselves life, right? We I don't think we know quite how translation machinery as a whole uh, fits into equation. Because so we, we try to understand um, ribosomes, RNA, how the linear information is processed, um, or the genetic code, why 
this co codons, not others, Y20, not more, not less. Um, and we are sort of moving towards transition. That's that's what we are working on anyway, uh, to finally look at the patterns in which this uh, system operates itself. And, and if you understand that, you're really unlocking a very emergent behavior. Uh, one of the things you didn't mention is physical. Is there something to mention about that component that's interesting? There's actually a paper uh, published in 2013, I wanna say the first author is Zirnov. Um, so they uh, surveyed a computational um, engineered systems level computation energy consumption, okay? And they tried to understand whether the universe is using its own, or life is using its full capacity of energy consumption. And whether um, if different planets in the universe had life, would the capacity would increase or decrease? Is, does life operate at its energy maximum? And uh, and they think that it does, that it actually operates at an efficiency that is far more above and beyond any computational system. How is that possible to determine at all? That you tell me. That's why I dropped the citation. Yeah. I, I found the citation. It's quite an interesting paper. It's a bit, you know, it's a... Um, uh, it's a obviously you can only calculate and infer these things, uh, but uh, it's a good question to ask: Is the life that we see here on Earth and life elsewhere in the universe is it using the energy most efficiently? Yeah, yeah. I, it I, seems to be very efficient. I mean, again, if we compare it to computers, it seems to be incredibly efficient at using yeah. energy. I think they, they look at the like the theoretical optimum for electronic devices Got it. and then try to understand uh, where life falls on, on this and life is certainly more efficient. And that's ultimately the physical side. How well are you using for this entire mechanism the energy available to you? And um, so given, given all the resilience to errors and all that kind of stuff, it seems that it's close to its maximum. Yeah. And this this paper aside, it does seem that life, obviously that's the constraint we have on Earth, right, is the amount of energy. Yeah. So that's one way to define life. Well, the input is energy and the output is what? I don't know. Self-replicating. Wait, how, okay, let's go there. How do you, how do you personally define life? Do you have a, do you have a favorite definition that you try to sneak up on? Um. Oh, is it possible I, to define life on Earth? I don't know. It depends on what you are defining it for. If you're defining it for finding different life forms, then it probably needs to have some quantification in it so that you can uh, use it in, in whatever the mission that you're operating so to. You mean like life. it's not binary? It's uh, This is like a 7 out of 10? Uh, on the life, life like li I, life like I, I don't know I, I don't I don't think that defining is that essential I think it's a good exercise but I'm not sure if the if we need to agree um, a universally defined way of understanding life uh, because the definition itself seems to be ever evolving anyway right we have the NASA's definition it's it is it has its uh minuses and pluses, but it seems to be doing its job. But what what are the different, if there is a line and it's impossible or unproductive to define that line, nevertheless, we know it when we see it is one definition that the Supreme Court likes. And that's a kind of an important thing to um, to think about when we look about, when we look at life on other planets. So how do we, uh, try to identify if a thing is living when we go to Mars, when we go to uh, the different moons in our solar system, when we go outside our solar system to look for life yeah. on other planets. It's unlikely to be a, a sort of a smoking gun event, right? It's not gonna be, hey, I found this. You don't think so? I don't think so. Unless you find an elephant on some exoplanet, then I can say, yeah, that's there's life here. No, but isn't there a dynamic nature to the thing? like? Uh, it moves, it has a membrane that looks like there's stuff inside. It doesn't versus... need to move, right? I mean, like look at plants. I mean, they, they grow, but there are plants that are, can be also pretty dormant. And arguably they are 
most they do everything that uh, one of my favorite professors once said that the plant does everything that a giraffe does without moving. So movement is Very not Zen statement necessarily. <laughs> but on a certain time scale, the the plant does move. It just moves slower. Yes, it moves pretty. I would I would say that, and I'm, 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 that I'm, it's hard to quantify this or even measure it. But it is a um, life is definitely the, um, chemistry finding solutions, right? So it is uh, chemistry exploring itself and <laughs> and maintaining this exploration for billions of years. So okay, so a planet is a bunch of chemistry, and then you run it and say, all right. Figure out what uh, what cool stuff you can come up with. That's essentially what life is. Given a chemistry, what is the cool stuff I can come up if, with? If that chemistry or the solutions that it embarks upon are maintained in a form of memory, right? So it, it's the, it's, you you don't just need to have the uh, explore exploring chemical space, but you need to also maintain a memory of some of those solutions for over long periods of time. So that's the memory component um, makes it more living memory. to me. Because ke chemistry can always sample, right? So chemistry is chemistry. But are you just constantly sampling or are you building on your former solutions and then maintaining a memory of those solutions over billions of years? Or at least that's what happened here. Chemistry can't uh, build life if it's always living in the moment. The physicist will be very upset with you. Okay, so memory could be a fundamental. I mean, life is not just. Life. I mean, life is obviously the chemistry and physics uh, leading to biology. So this is not a disciplinary problem of one discipline triumphing other discipline. It's that, but what what you need to have is definitely. I mean, chemistry is everywhere. Right? I tend to think you can be a chemist you can study chemistry you can study physics you can study geology anywhere in the universe but this is the only place you can study biology this is the only place to be a biologist Earth. that's it yeah so so definitely something very fundamental happened here and you cannot take biology out of the equation if you want to understand how that vast chemistry space how that general sequence space got narrowed down to what was what is available or what is used by life you need to understand the rules of selection, and that's when evolution and biology comes into play. So the, the rules of natural selection operate to you on the level of biology? The rules? I don't know if there are any um, rules like that. It would be fascinating to find in terms of the biology's rules. That's a very interesting and um, it's a very fascinating area of study now. And probably we will hear more about that in the decades to come. But if you want to go from the, the broad to specific, you need to understand the rules of selection. And that is going to come from understanding biology, yes.